So I'm going to give a short overview of the inquiry so far, what it is, what it's done, what it can do, what we hope for, and where we hope to be at the end of it. Um, hearing Ricky, Lisa, Duane, and all the other people affected, they so clearly deserve a proper redress, truth and justice. And it's a sort of enormous frustration that our system is not particularly good at providing truth and justice. In civil litigation, the aim is to provide justice for an individual by compensation. That's a very rough sort of justice. It's measured in money. It's not about truth. An inquiry is almost the diametric opposite. And an inquiry is not about justice. It's about truth. It's not brought by an individual. It's brought by a government department. And its aim is to find out what happened and make policy recommendations for the future. So it has inherent frustrations for individuals involved in the inquiry. But it does have opportunities, and the main opportunity is to find out exactly what went on. And in his opening remarks, Will Pitchford said um, that the main purpose of the inquiry is to discover the truth. Now, inquiries vary. The most successful ones tend to be into small, single issues. What happened on one day, like Bloody Sunday, or in one event, one death? Inquiries that are very, very big, very wide-ranging, like the inquiry into child abuse, sometimes founder on the width of their ambition. Now, we have a risk in our inquiry. The terms of reference include all undercover policing. We suspect that was something introduced by the police to try and make it too big, too unmanageable. But the, although the main focus will be the undercover policing units, the Special Demonstration Squad, the National Police Intelligence Unit, Public Order Intelligence Unit, one of its acronyms, the, that is only, it's not limited to those policing units, those secret undercover cop units. It can, it is intended to cover undercover policing into um, terrorism, drug trafficking, people trafficking, and there is a major potential pitfall. And one of our jobs is to steer it as closely as possible to the areas of political policing, which are the things that really matter, and which is the reason it was started. Now, Theresa May said in her opening remarks that it was intended to provide justice. That was hot air. It's not about providing justice. It's about finding out what went on. Um, I've talked a little bit about the risks. The, we're already over a year into the inquiry. We've had some very important rulings, some very important um, initial uh, orders, but we haven't got anywhere near the evidence. And the other risk is the police themselves. They appear to be obfuscating, delaying. They're making applications which they must know are bound to fail, uh, which then just delay things further. There's a serious problem with the way the police are behaving. Their stated commitment is to the success of the inquiry. Their behaviour is very different. There's evidence that they've been destroying documents. They're behaving true to form. We need a very, very robust chair, and we need very, very robust activities by the lawyers to keep this inquiry on track. So what are the strengths? What do we have? Well, the first and greatest strength of this inquiry is all the activists, all the people affected, who are the reason that the inquiry came into existence. It's the hard work, the dedication, the bravery of the people affected, which meant that this first saw the light of day, and which led to Theresa May making the decision to have a public inquiry and to have a proper public inquiry with proper powers. The perse those perseverance and skills which unearthed the wrongdoing are now part of the inquiry, those core participants, and there are a lot of core participants and a great deal of, a large number of lawyers, all of those people have between them 50, 60 years of campaigning activity, skill, experience and knowledge. That is very, very powerful and it's particularly powerful when it's such a broad church of the progressive history of this country working together. It's always unprecedented that you get everybody from the Labour Party to the Communist Party to from environmental activi activists, uh, animal rights activists, social justice movements, bereaved families, all operating with one voice. That makes us strong in the inquiry. It doesn't speed the inquiry up. It doesn't mean we're going to get what we want out of it, but it gives us a very strong voice. It means we can also 
act quickly. If the inquiry goes off the rails, if it does something wrong, if it acts irrationally, we can challenge it, we can judicially review. So there is hope that we will be there, that the inquiry will be deliver what it should deliver, which is answers, the truth. Um, so we've, what has happened so far? The first stage was the um, appointment, as it were, the designation of core participants. There's a very broad cross-section of, cross of core participants, intended to give a, a flavour of the spider pollen over the past 50 years. Not everybody, as we've heard from Ricky, who was spied on is a core participant. That's potentially a flaw, but there are representatives of most of the spied on types of groups in the inquiry flying the flag and speaking for everybody else and working with everybody outside the campaigners and everybody else outside the inquiry. The next major issue that's been dealt with is the way an analysis of how the chair will deal with applications for information to be kept secret. These are called restriction orders. The presumption is an inquiry is public, it's open. It's open for anybody who want, who's giving evidence to the inquiry to ask for an order under section 19 that this evidence or information or name will be secret. Now, before deciding any of those, the chair has delivered his ruling on the principles he applied. There were arguments put to him. The police argument was, Almost everything should be in secret. Nobody should know what happened. Nobody's entitled to know. The principle of secrecy is so important that it trumps everything else. Now, if that <coughs> argument, I mean, it's extraordinary that that's the approach they took. Thankfully, the chair had no, no difficulty in dismissing that approach, and he reaffirmed that the starting point is openness. So what we have as a result of this 85-page ruling is, in brief, the starting point is openness. If any police officer wants their identity to be secret, or anything that they did to be secret, they have to apply. The application will only be granted where they can demonstrate on strong evidence that there's a risk of harm. And that risk of harm will be weighed up against the public, out the public interest and openness. Where there's a serious risk to life, that weighs heavily in the balance. If it's a slight risk of, in, of, of inconvenience and an invasion of privacy, that will weigh lightly in the balance. And on the other side is the very significant and weighty public interest in getting to the truth, the stated purpose of the whole inquiry. Now, if those principles are applied as we hope they will, it will be difficult for the police to maintain secrecy, and we will get answers. However, the progress of these applications since the ruling in May has been unbelievably slow. The officers who want to be anonymous say they will be caused harm, and they've produced risk assessments, saying, see, this is the risk I face if my name is known. The people who produce those risk assessments have themselves applied to be anonymous. And in their witness statements, applying for anonymity, they say, we want to be anonymous because we're very close friends with the officers. We've worked closely with them, they trust us, we're colleagues, and we have a professional obligation to try to keep their names secret. You see the conflict. They're intended to be independent assessors of risk, yet they're working very, very closely with people who they've promised to protect their identity. We say this is impossible. This is a clear um, conflict of interest. What are you doing putting these people up for anonymity? The chair agrees. Words are had. The uh, uh, application is withdrawn or amended. Fine, so far so good, but another five months have gone by and we're still no closer. So the message from the inquiry is that, is that we have a robust chair, we have very good opportunities, we have an incredible group of lawyers and participants working as one. We have a strong voice, but we have the police on the other side doing their damnedest to delay. Um, the, the inquiry is, can only do what the Inquiries Act says it can do. It's a creature of statute. It's not like a judge in a court who can just go off on a frolic of his own and impose injunctions. The chair has to follow the inquiry rules. So the police do have this opportunity to delay. Nevertheless, 
within the next few months, we will have the first applications for secrecy over information. The first going to deal with those officers whose name is already known, then they're going to go on later to anonymity applications. We will see, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, um, and we'll see what they do. The chair, what are we hopeful for? Pitchford, in his opening remarks, as I said, said the purpose of the inquiry is to discover his, the truth. He does respect the need for the core participants to know. The non-police, non-state core participants don't have a, this is Pitchford speaking, don't have a personal interest to serve, as with litigants in a civil trial. However, they undoubtedly have an interest in the vindication of their evidence. Since they believe they were targets of undercover policing, their common interest is likely to be a conclusion by the inquiry that they were targeted or subject to report, and targeting or reporting to which they were subjected was an unjustifiable or insufficiently justifiable intrusion into their private lives. So we have a robust chair. He understands the need to know. He's declared he wants to get at the truth. The only good thing about Theresa May being Prime Minister is that this was her inquiry. With the foundering of the child abuse inquiry, it may be that it's politically important for her to see this as a success and to put more resources into it. Uh, she may not be able to afford to let it founder as well. So we now have the best opportunity there's ever been to find out what happened, who ordered it, what was, who was in charge of the wholesale surveillance and disruption of the left and progressive movements over the past 50 years, a chance to expose a conspiracy and understand what happened to people's lives, a chance to make policy changes and recommendations. We won't get individual justice that way, but we may get a rough sort of truth. And after we get the rough sort of truth, there is then the possibility of the elusive ideal, truth and justice. There may even be prosecutions there may be other civil claims arising out of the evidence that appears in the inquiry. So for me, it's really important that we keep working within this inquiry, that we keep pushing for the truth. It is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to find out what happened, what went on, and how the progressive movements in our country were subjugated and uh, interfered with by political police forces.